uh, the role of dark matter in making galaxies. So in the process of galaxy formation. So um, there's a little animation here that I'm going to try to use to tell the story of galaxy formation. And it goes like this. So let's zoom back to way early in the universe when matter is uniformly distributed. All right, so we've got normal matter that's denoted by these green particles and the dark matter by these black particles. And we're assuming that they're more or less homogeneous and isotropic across all of space. So in this situation, um, at first we don't have any light, but eventually we do have light and that radiation heats up the normal matter, so all the green particles, and keeps those particles uh, spread out from each other. So it's because the radiation interacts with normal matter that this process keeps normal matter spread out. But radiation does not interact with the dark matter, and so it doesn't keep the dark matter spread out. Therefore, the gravity of the dark matter particles start to clump them together. And because we're uh, modeling cold dark matter instead of hot dark matter, this process happens quickly. So dark matter begins to clump. And over time, as it clumps closer and closer together under its own gravity, because it's not being affected by that radiation, then it also starts to impact the normal matter particles because the dark matter and normal matter, they can still attract each other due to gravity. And so eventually the normal matter also starts to clump together with the dark matter. So those dark matter um, clumps basically act as seeds to start to clump together the normal matter around them. And as the universe gets older and older, the clumps themselves start to grow together under their own gravity and eventually combine into these sort of proto-galactic clumps. These tended to be on the order of mass similar to a globular cluster or a dwarf galaxy. So if you're trying to figure out what is the scale that we're talking about here, this is about as much mass as a, as a globular cluster or dwarf galaxy. So eventually these continue to coalesce and become galaxies. So um, dark matter plays a huge role in causing that normal matter to clump together. And if the dark matter was unable to clump together because of interaction with radiation, then normal matter wouldn't clump together to form those protogalactic pieces either. And so this is one of the biggest pieces of evidence we have that dark matter is a particle that um, is, falls under the umbrella of cold dark matter because it does actually reproduce some of the observations that we see about how and uh, how galaxies are distributed in space. Um, the light that's flying around from the early universe still exists and it tells us more about the conditions at that time. So that's how we know about this, you know, early universe story. And we'll talk about that next week. Okay, so that's my clumping animation story. Um, it's kind of weird, but what questions do you have about this idea? Okay, so um, I want to tie this back to our earlier discussion about galaxy formation from last week. So now we are basically adding to what we already know about how galaxies formed. Our new piece of information is that dark matter clumps will, was what helped initial clumps of gas to, to form together into clouds. And when we discussed the Milky Way formation model, we said that it started with a cloud of gas that collapsed, but we didn't tell you where that cloud of gas came from. Now you know. Um, so once you have this cloud of gas, the overall model of galaxy formation is the same regardless of what type of galaxy we're talking about. The overall process is simply that that gas cloud collapses, and as it collapses, small, more dense regions collapse into stars. So um, this process forms elliptical galaxies by what your book calls a top-down process. So the idea is basically that the elliptical galaxy is formed all at once from the cloud. So the, the gas within that cloud forms stars really fast and that basically just creates an elliptical galaxy immediately. Um, there's a different process which your book calls bottom down. So that's the process by which we first form smaller galaxy fragments 
And then those galaxy fragments merge together to become elliptical galaxies. So it seems like both of these processes probably each happened. And this is the bottom up process. So I guess the difference between the top down and the bottom up is that in the bottom up process, you're, you're forming smaller pieces first, which merge together to form ellipticals. In the top down, you're forming the whole elliptical in one go. And this bottom up process is not just for making elliptical galaxies. That's also what creates our spiral galaxy bulges and also, I guess, the globular clusters in their halos. And then those, um, the bulge halo and other galaxy fragments eventually merge together to form our modern day spiral galaxies with their spiral arms. So all of this is part of that bottom up galaxy formation. Um, and then this is not really where the evolution picture ends, right? We could also say, well, spiral galaxies can merge with each other to form elliptical galaxies. Um, but this doesn't have to happen. And that's good. I mean, we're not yet an elliptical galaxy, but once Milky Way and Andromeda collide to become Milkomeda, that will probably be an elliptical in the end. So hopefully this kind of helps to clarify our galaxy evolution ideas and tie it back to this role of dark matter in the formation process. So, okay. When we talk about universe structures, right, there's a lot of different scales that we could look at. Um, those small differences in density in the early universe lead to all the structures that we see because it's seeding those early gas clouds which become our galaxy fragments, our globular clusters, stars, etc. Right? And then the galaxies themselves can form directly from these clouds or from those small fragments. And then even then, after you have entire galaxies, those can be pulled together under their own gravity to make clusters. And then they can merge together over time so that the galaxies within clusters form just larger and larger ellipticals. And then this is not the end of the process. Entire clusters are also being pulled toward other clusters um, to make super clusters. And as this process continues from starting with that, you know, smooth homogeneous and isotropic distribution of matter, Basically, things just clump together from smaller scales up to larger scales until you end up with this um, structure of the filaments containing most of the dark matter and regular matter, and then the voids where nothing is really left in between because everything has been pulled together into these strands and clumps. So um, the end result of all of this is that when we um, use supercomputers to model this formation process in three dimensions. Then we look at different kind of, you know, volumes of the universe structure over time. And we see that the present day models that we create look like what we see with the redshift surveys. If you took a cut of two dimensions through this box, then you would see something that looks like filaments surrounding voids, right? And you would see the matter, which is indicated here in yellow and white, uh, in little clumps along the filaments, which are mostly made of dark matter. Um, to my knowledge, we don't have an excellent map of dark matter for, um, to compare to this um, type of supercomputer model. Um, and that's why we're trying to measure dark matter actively using all the methods I told you about before. Uh, but we do have the galaxy surveys that show us the location of these filaments at least with the regular matter. All right, so that is the origin of this weird kind of bubble situation that we have for galaxy locations.